Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And today's interview is being uh, conducted here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio. And that's locally administered by Brian Powers, who, who is our cameraman today. Today's date is the 18th of April, 2018. Uh, Wednesday, and today we have the honor and privilege of interviewing United States Army veteran Daryl Doyle. Yes, sir. Mr. Doyle, it's a pleasure Pleased to, meet, to you. meet you, sir. Okay to call you Daryl? It is. Yeah. Daryl, if you would, uh, tell us when you were born and where you were born. Uh, Charles, uh, April 30th, coming up close, yes. uh, 1947 in Charleston, West Virginia. I see, and uh, what were your parents' names? David and Dorotha. Uh, and your mother's maiden name? Buckland. Who? Buckland. 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 And what did your dad do for a living, uh, Daryl? Uh, my dad's family were, uh, well, for the lack of the term, they were meat cutters. Uh -huh. They owned a meat market in Hot Springs, Virginia, and uh, that's what they did for a living. They that's went out to the farms and slaughtered and cut and mm -hmm. ran their meat market. And that was my uh, dad's family. I see. Did your mother work, Daryl? My mother was a nurse. She was a registered nurse. I see. She worked at uh, DePaul Hospital, Norfolk, Virginia. I see. She worked at Kanawha Valley Hospital, Charleston, West Virginia. She worked at Green Memorial in Xenia, Ohio. So when we moved, she, she worked. So uh, when you were born, you folks were living there in Charleston? Uh, no, they were living in a community called Canelton. West Virginia. It was a coal camp. Mm -hmm. Cannon and Coal and Coke Company. I see. And what schools did you go to then? Started out at Cannon Elementary and went on from there to Montgomery Elementary and Montgomery Junior High, Montgomery High School, and then we moved to Norfolk, Virginia, and that's when I went to Granby High School. I see. And, and you I, graduated from I, No, I came back to West Virginia just to graduate, to be with the kids that, you know, I kind of grew up with, wanted to be with at graduation. And so you graduated from Montgomery? Yes, Montgomery High School. I see. Uh, what church did you folks belong to? Um, Methodist Church as a, as a youth. Mm -hmm. And as a teenager, my uncle was a minister at a church of God, and so my mother and I... Right. Got to go to that, and then of course when I met my wife and we got married, we got married in the Methodist Church, and we've been a member ever since oh, in Xenia. Yeah. Um, when did you move to Norfolk? Oh, 1961. I see. What what occasioned uh, you folks to move from? <laughs> Long so. story. My sister and her husband. He was in the Navy, and he moved there. Well, my sister was the kind of person that couldn't make it a week without my mother. So mom said, we're moving to Norfolk. Pack up the car and away we go. <laughs> I see. Not that I necessarily wanted to, but... Uh, well, what did your, your dad do for a living? Then? Mom and dad were separated at that time. He was oh. still in the meat business. Oh, okay. So. And all, so they separated and, uh, you know, the rest was history from He my, stayed back there towards... Uh, he Canada. stayed back in Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, where the old fa where the family had the meat market uh -huh. and everything. So, so when your mom went there in 1961 to Norfolk, uh, yeah. she was a registered nurse. You say, yeah. where did she? What she do there? She worked at DePaul Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia. I see. As a nurse, and uh, myself and my I just went to school, hung out on the beach. Uh, yeah, you said that you had a sister that was there. How many brothers and sisters did you have? Two. I had an older sister who died at 73, just about four years ago, and I had a younger brother at 56 that passed away two years ago. I see. I see. So you went back to um, Montgomery High and graduated. So after you graduated, that was 1965. Five. Went to West Virginia Tech uh, studying engineering. I in see. 1965, and in the fall of 1966, got drafted by Uncle Sam right out of college. Somebody said, well, they couldn't do that. I said, yeah, they could, because our county expended all of its draftees, and then they went in, they took 40 of us right out of college. 
What year were you in in college at that time? Sophomore, I'd been my sophomore year. I see. Um, so did that come as a shock or anything of that nature? It came as a pretty good shock to me, yeah. um, you know, and along with the other guys. Yeah. You know, it was kind of a, but I knew at the time they were taking about 55,000 a month draftees yeah. uh, all across the country. And uh, so they put us on the bus and hauled us away. So that was November the 5th when you were? November 15th, yeah. November 15th, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. 65. Yes. Um, 65 or 66? 66, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, November the 15th, 66. Put us on the bus and took us to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. That was our training depot. And what type of training did you go there? Infantry, to, or infantry. just basic training. And how long of a period did that cover, would you say? That was an eight-week eight period. We got out of there the 1st of January. In fact, they sent us home for Christmas and told us not to come back and report to our next duty station. I and see. me being an engineer was Two of, the, two of my friends that came from college with me were both in engineering. Well, when our orders came down from basic training, the two of them got Fort Belvoir, Virginia for engineering school. My orders said Fort Belvoir, Virginia, engineering school. And I thought, all right. So we loaded up on the bus, getting ready to be transported. And I got a call and they got me and said, nope, you're going elsewhere. I said, what do you mean going elsewhere? Where are you going to this school? So they ended up sending me to radio school in Fort Dix, New Jersey in January of 66. And I proceeded in that. At that time, we were Ditt and Dom in. We still used Morse code out in the field for forward observers and artillery and all that stuff. But of course, now that's gone to the wayside. But uh, I was there uh, two months, and I was in the top 5% of the class, so they sent me to Fort Gordon, Georgia for advanced communications. At that time, I learned comm center operation, operations, cryptographic operations, uh, codes, different things like that, and uh, left there ooh, just about the middle of the end of April and uh, had orders to go, I had an APO number on my orders. That was all I had. And I'm trying to find out where am I going, where am I going? Well, they said, well, you get, go to Kennedy Airport and they'll, they'll get you on a plane. <laughs> that was one of the first MATS transports before they were transporting everybody by ship. And at that time when I started, I was one of the few that started first. In fact, I flew over with a captain uh, who was going to Europe. So finally I found out, I, w I went to Fort Dix before I left, and I asked them, I said, where's this APO? And they said, we don't have it on the books anywhere. And I said, what do you mean? And uh, he said, just get your ticket, go here, somebody will meet you. Well, I landed in Paris, got off, went to the info area, and I told him, I said, I was supposed to meet so-and-so here, they're not here, what do I do? He said, we don't know what to do. We don't know what to do with you. So they called somebody and, and they came out and got me and uh, took me into downtown Paris. We went right off the uh, Champs-Élysées. It's a little hotel there called the Wagram. The what? The Wagram, Hotel Wagram. That's where they billeted us. We worked in the basement. If you go, we had to go around the Champs, around the Arc de Triomphe and down a, a couple of blocks and then down into the basement of a building. And that's where they had the comm center set up. This is what, around May or June? 66, yeah, May of 67. Well, 67. Yeah, right in that 66, May of 66. May of 67. No, May of 60, would have been, what's it say there? Uh, it doesn't, but I'm, I'm backing up because you joined on, uh, in November of 66. In January, you were still at. Oh, oh, yes, uh, yes, so. yes. I apologize. You no, are no, correct. I just, like I said, I'll be 71. No, we, there's 12 a, days. There's, there's a <laughs> test on these interviews when we're finished. <laughs> Edit. <laughs> but uh, uh, that sounds like tough duty, Paris. Oh, it was. It was really tough. Um, a lot of nights in the bars. But uh, I was there for a, a little short while, and then all of a sudden, that's when de Gaulle decided to kick 
NATO out of France. That's right. And that's when all heck broke loose. I mean, we had to ship everything out of France to Now, you've got classified material, don't you? Yes, I have a top secret clearance, top secret NATO clearance. Mm -hmm. The President of the United States and I can look at the same material. Back then, I don't know whether it's worth anything now, but um, they moved, we moved everything up to a place called Mons, Belgium. Mm -hmm. That's where they set up NATO in Belgium. Right. But Mons was a air base. The air base was called Chevre. The town is called Mons. And we set up all the communications there. We moved everything out, moved it up. What we didn't take, we destroyed. And uh, I mean, it was semi after semi after semi rolling day and night, day and night, just heading north to Belgium. What was the name of your outfit? Did you have a nomenclature? USER uh, or Stratcom Europe was what I was affiliated with, Fourth Signal Group, which is no longer in existence. In fact, our headquarters Fort Huachuca, Arizona has been closed. I don't even think it's in existence anymore. Mm -hmm. So, but that was who I was with. So we moved everything up to Belgium and I was telling Patrick coming down, very interesting story. When we got up to Chevra Air Base, the entire base had been built by concentration camp prisoners. Cobblestones, I mean, the streets were all beautiful laid cobblestones, just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. He come into the. He come in, got us all, and he said, "Hey, I want you guys to see something." So he, we loaded into the sedan and we went across the airbase and uh, pulled up to this huge hangar. Went in, opened the door. He said, "Now you're going to go down about a hundred steps." So he opened a little side door and down, down we went. We got down to the bottom. He said, "Now you guys stay here." He opened the door and went in, and turned the lights on. He said, "Now you can come in." The whole area. The hangar floor dropped. The planes rolled off. The floor went up. And they wanted the planes up after the Ameri after England and the Americans bombed. They would rolled the planes on, bring them up. They're ready to go. I'll be That's their engineering ability that they had. And that, the name of that base again? Chevra yeah. Air Base at Mons. M O N S. And how do you spell Chevra? C H E V E R S. I think. Okay, Chevra. Yeah. Okay. And um, the planes were stored up uh, on an elevator type uh, apparatus they and then brought it down? Brought down and, and uh, I mean it just underneath was huge, huge. They, they could probably put 20, 30 planes under there. It's just kind of a neat well, little antidote. Certainly, yeah. Um, just a little neat antidote. But that, that whole area was built by concentration camp prisoners. Including the air? The air base, everything. Uh, everything was built by them. Wow, that's interesting. And then I was there uh, May until September, and they said, we're moving you to Munich. They need, they need help in Munich, Germany. I said, okay. So I got to go to Munich. Um, Where were you stationed at in Munich? Uh, McGraw Cassern. McGraw Cassern. Mm -hmm. It was an SS uh, base. It was an SS camp. It was an SS uh, teaching facility during the war, huge block buildings, huge block buildings. But uh, I was stationed there in the comm center, and uh, then I got. Um, they needed some help down in Asmara, Ethiopia, for 30 days. They wouldn't send you down there for any more, or any less. And what was the name of that? Asmara, Asmara Ethiopia. And I volunteered to go down. They had a listening post down there. And I volunteered to go down there and spent 30 days there and came back. But it was kind of funny. They flew you in. We got seven days in Athens, Greece going and seven days in Athens, Greece coming back, kind of as a reward for putting up with being up in that desert. So they'd fly us in on a C-130. The crew leaving, they would land the helicopter beside the C-130. They would walk into the C-130, we would get on the helicopter with our gear, they'd fly us out to the compound, land right in the compound, had a 12 foot high bobbed wire fence around it, and left. 30 days later, we, lay, we load up, go in, change planes, <laughs> another crew comes in. But that was at a listening post in Asmara, Ethiopia. Now, when you, when you say a listening post, explain what that means. Communications, any communications coming out of Russia, coming out of uh, the Arab nations, anywhere along that line, we were able to intercept and uh, decode or recode, send it to Washington, send it to whoever needed to get it. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we worked highly with the 5th Military Intelligence. And uh, so then I went back to Munich and spent the rest of 67 and went in through 68. We uh, got to the summer of 68. Of course, I'm down almost to 90 days and I'm going, Phew. hope nothing doesn't happen. So um, they, that was when the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia in August or September of 68. I forget which it was. And we had been, we had befriended some Czech people in, in Munich that we knew and talked to and interviewed and got some information out. Of course, their biggest thing was, would America and Germany come in if Russia invaded? Can't tell you that. Mm-hmm. So we were lit monitoring the radios when the Russian tanks came into Prague and then just opened fire on those people. Oh. And, all, and that was in 68. And they said, that we went up to the border the Russians had like 10 battalions on their side of the border, and the, us and the Germans had about six on ours. And I'm going, I only got 90 days left. Come <laughs> on, people, let me go home. Um, time came, they came and got me and said, here's your orders, you're going home. Came home, got out, came back to, uh, I can't think of that air base in uh, New Jersey. But it's right there by Fort Dix. Uh, flew into there. Is that McGraw? McGraw Air Base? Flew into there and, and processed out through Fort Dix. And uh, left there and went to the Philadelphia airport, changed into my civilian clothes, and came home to Dayton. Because, you know, you weren't too, much, too well appreciated in military uniform back then in 68. Mm-hmm. Did you land in your uniform? Yes, yes, we had to, we had to travel in uniform. Mm-hmm. When you were uh, in Mons, or in Paris, did you have any free time while you were there? To go oh yeah, there? yeah. I was telling uh, Mr. Allen that our last meal in Paris, we had dinner on the Eiffel Tower. I see. There was four of us decided to go up and have dinner. It was kind of interesting, neat. Did you uh, go to the Crazy Horse or uh, Moulin Rouge while you were there? Uh, it's solid. I didn't didn't care to go to those. I got the privilege of going to Normandy, which I dearly, dearly loved, mm-hmm. and. Uh, just brought a tear to my eye when you come up over that bank. And you Colville, look at those, Colville, Samara. You look yeah. at those cross, those those markers, and it just breaks your heart. Yes, it does. Breaks your heart. But that was, you know, and, and just got to travel around a little bit, not a whole lot. You know, when you're a private, you don't have a lot of money. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm well familiar with that. Um, you, uh, when you were in Mons, uh, did you get uh, down into any of the communities there? We went into Mons frequently itself, you know, got GIs going to a bar, eating, getting food, and, mm-hmm. and all. I always thought it was unique how the, the uh, Belgiques uh, have the little French fry stands right on the street. And you go up and you tell them you want French fries, and they roll up a newspaper and fill it full and throw mayonnaise on it, and they go, here it are. All right. Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise, too. and I've been so used to ketchup, and I, but boy, you know what? I got used to that mayonnaise. That was mayonnaise pretty good. Mayonnaise pretty good. That was yeah. good. That was good. Did you have much to do with anyone, other departments of NATO while you were in Mons? Other than eating lunch with them. Uh, we had lunch with the British and um, our mess hall uh, served both the United States, British, and one more, I forget who we had there. But they had, this was a mistake, they put the Turks and the Greeks together in the mess hall. And boy, that didn't set well. They had fights every day in that mess hall. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't like each other. They didn't, <laughs> Even then. They've been fighting each other since biblical times. I believe it. I yeah. believe it. But, um, you know, I handled, handled uh, one of the things I do remember, and it cost us about three days worth of work, and I can't remember the name of the ship, but do you remember the ship's name that was captured off of Korea? Pueblo. Pueblo. That was a lift, listening ship. It did the same things we did. Mm-hmm. Well, every piece of our equipment had to be Butcher was the, uh, commander, shut down right? and rerun up and we just, it cost us three days to get everything online because Munich had 34 uh, teletype circuits that went everywhere. You were in Munich when the uh, Pueblo was, mm-hmm. captured. was captured? Yeah. That was, that was something that we, I, I, and I can't understand 
and they don't know to this day what was compromised on the ship. We just assumed everything was compromised. Mm -hmm. But the way we had Munich set up, I can't believe they didn't have that ship set up the same way. I mean, all we had to do, the last man out, pushed a button, and when whoever went in there the next time, there wasn't anything in there. I don't think they did that on the Pueblo. They though. didn't. The, uh, the North Koreans still have the, the Pueblo, as you're aware. It's uh, now like a, uh, a prized possession of theirs. Oh, they, yeah. They show off to the... Of course, all the equipment that's on there now is obsolete. Uh, they, they don't do the same communications that we did back then. It's much, much better. When you were in Munich, did you uh, have a lot of time to go into town? And uh, I did, I did. In surround. fact, I played on a uh, German-American baseball team. It was set up through the Caserne there where I was at the post. And we had about six Germans and the rest Americans, and those guys were great. But we traveled all over Europe playing baseball in 68. And all we'd get on a plane, fly to Rota, Spain, play baseball, come back to Munich, get on a plane, fly down to Naples, play a baseball game, <laughs> come back. Uh -huh. But got to see a lot that way. But Munich, uh, I was really impressed with, besides the, the uh, Oktoberfest, um, they have a museum there, the Deutsches Museum. It's like our Smithsonian. And I was fascinated being an engineering student. The, the engineering feats that they accomplished were tremendous. And uh, I just would spend days there at the, at the uh, museum just looking at stuff. Is that it. in Munich proper? Yes. It's right by the Isar River, right by mm -hmm. the river. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we had, uh, we had posts at uh, Batolls, which was 10th Special Forces. And we had posts at uh, Birch's Garden, Leipzig, down there, or uh, yeah, Birch's Garden, Garmisch, down in there. Yeah. So we got Garmisch is not that far outside of um, Munich, no, south, southeast. No. Uh, about an hour, hour and a half. Right. I got to uh, go to Dachau and see that, and that was, that was really, really an eye opener for me as a, as a young 20, 21 year old. Yeah. Never seen anything like that, but never want to either. But, um, you know, we, it, like terrible. a terrible, yeah. But we had a, I, you know, I, I, as I told Mr. Allen, I said, I'm the kind of guy that went to work, did his job, came home, and was done. Mm -hmm. Well, you had some good experiences. Uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, I got uh, to see a lot. As far as personal education about the, our military, uh, did you, what, what were your thoughts about this uh, Czechoslovakian uh, episode where we did not interfere? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking about. I really, really don't know what they were thinking on that mm -hmm. at all. I think they were just hoping that we would come across that border. The Czech people were. I'm yes, sure, I am aware. Yeah. At that time, of course, when the Iron Curtain fell and everything, it's probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to those people. Right. But beautiful area over there. Mm hmm What about Munich? Um, did you get down to the Opera House or the yes. Ratskeller? Yes, yes. Got down there, uh, got to the, got there se several times, of course. Uh, and the, the one thing I remember there is everybody wants to leave there with one of the Munich, one of the Hofbrau House mugs. Mm -hmm. It's a clay mug with just a blue HB on it, right. H, H Hofbrau House on it. And everybody wants one. And they stand up there at the door. They got two huge guards, and they got sticks about this long. And as you walk out, these girls that have these purses and heavy coats on, they just hit the pockets, hit the purse. If they heard it broke, they just pointed you right over here, and you went over and paid for the mug. I always remember that. That was funny. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but um, when I was in Munich, I, well. To go back a little bit, when I was in Paris, France, they didn't have the subway. When I was in Munich, Germany, they didn't have the subway. In fact, at that time, Munich was getting ready for the Olympics, and they had closed down the one concern which the 24th Infantry Division was at because they wanted that property and that housing 
for the Olympics. So mm -hmm. they moved them up to Augsburg, Germany. And the whole 24th was up there. And when they, when the Israeli-Egyptian war occurred in 67, I sent the orders from Munich, they, they came in to us from the Pentagon, and I sent those orders on to the 24th that sent them to Point X in the desert in Israel. And I thought, why did they do that? And I was talking to my commanding officer, and I said, why would they, why would they even want to send them down there? He said, if anything happened and the Arabs broke through the Israeli lines, the 24th was there to plug it. I thought, okay. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's interesting too. That's another part of history that you don't read in the book. No, no. Yeah, but they sent the whole uh, whole unit, and while at Munich, uh, right there at our concern, since it was an SS uh, base, there is you go out our go out the back door of our of our billets, and you get there huge doors. You open the doors and you go down, and it's a road that goes from Munich to Augsburg, Germany underground. That's how those people were pretty shrewd during the war. Mm -hmm. They, and you go down to Garmisch and Birch's Garden down into the mountains, and you'd be driving along and the railroad track's coming this way and you're going this way and all of a sudden it just goes this way right into the mountain. You go down another couple hundred yards, it comes right into the mountain. Uh, I was informed by a German historian that that's where they built the aircraft and they would run the rail cars in, load the fuselage on and everything, and run it down to the next one and load the engines and, and all on and then take them to where they needed to And settle. this is down towards Augsburg? Augsburg, Gar Garmisch and Augsburg. Well, Garmisch, yeah, yeah. Down yeah. in the mountains. Right. And uh, the German engineering was just tremendous. I, I learned a lot from that, just what they did. As an aside, and that's, you heard us talking about this airman that was captured. Mm -hmm. That's where he uh, was bombing in July of 44 and was shot down and captured there at Garmisch. Oh, I'll be. Yeah. Um, it's interesting how it, you get some of, uh, and that's, I'm sure that was part of their target. I oh, don't know I'm for sure. a fact. Uh, sure. But uh, that's, that's, that's amazing how the Germans. Uh, uh, even to that facility up in Mons, what you talk about, where they would go down in case mm -hmm. they were bombed, if the planes were protected, come back up, and they were still building aircraft at the end of the war. Yeah. At a capacity that approached what they were doing in peacetime. Uh, ingenious people. Did, you know, Munich in 1967 and 68, when you were there, was full of, uh, of ex-Nazis. Oh, I'm sure. You know, I just wondered if you had any encounter with... No, I got to go to the, uh, what was it, the Brown House, mm -hmm. which they, we really bombed the daylights out of that. Of course, they've got three unknown soldiers buried there now in the sunken courtyard, but got to go through that, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, got to go to, uh, in fact, one of the guys that played baseball with us was a German fighter pilot, flew an F-4D Phantom out of uh, First and Fellbrook which is where the, in the Olympics where they went to take off and that's when they uh, blew up the helicopters and all there at first in Fellbrook, which was a German air base mm -hmm. and all, but got to go out, out there with him, but uh, he was a nice guy. His dad was a tank commander during World War II and all. He had some nice stories to tell I can imagine, dad, yeah. but uh, there was, I mean, you know, there was, there's a lot of interesting people that I, I, I had the privilege of doing a good job for good people and enjoying what I did. It wasn't anything flashy, it wasn't anything dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, volunteered four times for Vietnam because that's where the rank was and that's where the money was. Even though an E-5 only made $100 a month as an E-5. Very good. <laughs> Big difference in today. Uh, How was your food there at uh, Munich? 
The food was good. We had, uh, I got $50 for rations non-available so I could go and eat off base anytime I wanted to, but food was pretty good. You know, I ate a lot of breakfast. I didn't eat, usually eat lunch or dinner because I didn't care for meatloaf and chicken that much, but uh, breakfast was always pretty good. Yeah. But, you know, food, the chow was good, you know. I, I put on weight while I was in the military. Now, are you <laughs> single while you were over there? Yes. In Europe? Yes. Okay. Had had I met my wife while I was in the military, I would have probably stayed because I had tremendous duty stations and rank was coming fairly easy to me. But I would have went from there, I would have went on to OCS. I wouldn't have stayed in the listed man. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, we haven't covered uh, your time there in Ethiopia. Uh, <laughs> Tell me about the conditions there. In the, you're in the Hot. desert. You're in the desert. Is <laughs> Hot. Right? 140 degrees in the shade. Um, the only uh, facility that was, uh, well, and it really was air conditioned was the comm center. And we pretty much slept, ate, and drank in there. We didn't eat in the cafeteria because it was hotter than heck. We didn't even go out to the pool. The pool water was so hot you couldn't. you couldn't relax in it. So you just endured 30 days. You knew you were there. You knew you had a job to do and you were going to leave. Did you get off of your compound at no, all? No, you were not allowed. Okay. That's why I said when we landed, we got off the plane, onto the helicopter, they got off the helicopter, onto the plane, and gone. You had no contact with any of the public. Uh, did you have any contact with any natives? No, no. 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 You were not allowed to have any contact with those people. Okay. You know, we were just, just a listening post, mm -hmm. which I'm sure... The opposite side had there some place too, yeah. so, but we we could we could do we did quite a bit down there, you know. But it was I mean you know it was just interesting. I just thought it'd be neat to go. It was dead of winter in Munich, and I thought I don't want to be up here in the winter. <laughs> go down here, it's warmer. I didn't realize how warm it was. I should have researched a little better. <laughs> but I had all kinds of friends that went to Vietnam. Um, for the most part, most of them came back. Two of them didn't. They were helicopter pilots. But um, for the most part, everybody else came back. Everybody came back uh, okay. My brother-in-law did three tours, and he came back. And of course, thanks to the family and everybody else, he's okay. I mean, you know, he turned out okay. Uh, I've had a son that has served two tours in Iraq, 18 months from 03 to 05, and then again in 08 and 09. When he came home, his friends came to his mother and I, and they said, don't worry, we got him. He's a dad now, i got two kids. But now I am noticing, and I have talked to him. I said, now is this PTSD? Right. He's, he's starting to snap, he's starting to, you know, I said, son, you may want to talk to somebody, you know. He got his rotator cuff busted up when they got an RPG fired at him and his buddy were doing street sweeps in Mosul and it uh, blew him into the building and messed up his rotator cuff on his left shoulder. Mm -hmm. and he sees him about that but I asked I ask him, I said, do you think maybe you might want to, because he's getting a little older, he's 44 now, so, uh, but, you know, that's, that's basically it, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. You're in for the whole year of 1968, and the 68 is uh, when the Tet Offense took uh, place in Vietnam, and it's also uh, the year of all the uh, social unrest in our country. Oh, yeah. Uh, did you, were you affected in any manner about no. either one of those? No, no. We were pretty, you know. Uh, a funny story about being there at that time, I mean, today everybody's got a cell phone. Right. Everybody's got a computer. You can communicate with everybody. I mean, we talked to our son in, in Iraq every night because his ranger team, five-man ranger team, that was up in northern Iraq, had their own uplinks. So he would call us. They'd each one take a turn calling their families, and he'd call us every night mm -hmm. talk to him. Well, how's your day today? You know, how hot was it? Stuff like that. But then... Uh, you couldn't communicate. You just had no communications at all. Lost my train of thought there for a minute. We were talking about the social unrest in our country. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the and and we would get guys coming from the States over being reassigned to Munich. 
and they would be talking about this movie, that movie, this was going on, that was going on, because I didn't, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't have American television. We had AFN radio, and that was about it, but other than that, they, everybody kept talking about The Graduate, The Graduate, The Graduate as a movie. So when I got home, I thought, i got to see this movie, you know. Saw the movie, I was very, very disappointed. I can't figure out what they saw in it, but I didn't see the same thing. But uh, that was what everybody, that was kind of cute. I mean, everybody, because you know, when you communicated with your family, you wrote a letter. That's right. Nobody writes letters anymore. Nobody writes letters nowadays. No so, letters. No letters. That's a, a bygone art. Uh, what about the way uh, the civilians treated you in Belgium and Germany? Great. They were fabulous. Of course, they liked that American dollar. Mm -hmm. But no, they were very cordial. Uh, we had uh, Belgiques that worked with us uh, there in the, uh, in, at the base. Well, NATO headquarters was in Belgium. And it, uh, it was in Munich. It was up in Munich, the headquarters. Right. Right. Now, Na SHAPE, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, right. was right there in Mons. Right. That's but, what uh, The say. NATO headquarters was up in Brussels. Right. But SHAPE was right there. Right. And you asked me what my unit was. That was who we were attached to with SHAPE. Okay, good. Uh, you know, I had to learn, uh, had to learn all the country's uh, officers and epaulets. So if they drove by, we had to salute them. I just saluted everybody. <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> we, we had the same problem when I was in. We had uh, uh, Saudi Arabia airmen and their uniforms were so gorgeous uh, I'm walking along and I'm saluting these guys and they said oh you're saluting a private what are you doing that for I said how, how do you know the difference here uh, but uh, he's got that uniform I'm respecting him <laughs> yeah so you come back to the United States and uh, and were you ill-treated at all when you no, landed no. Uh, no, most people didn't even know I was in the had been in the military, mm -hmm. other than my family. Yeah. That was about it. So where did you go uh, as far as after you landed? You had to be discharged somewhere. I was discharged at Fort Dix. Okay. Processed out at Fort Dix, and uh, was told you got four more years, six years, four years of reserve duty. Right. And I went home, and they said you'll be getting orders. So I went home, and the orders I got were, you do not have to report to reserve duty. We've got enough already. You know, there's enough guys coming out, and we're full. We can't put you anywhere, so just consider it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to do reserve duty. So what did you do with yourself when you come home? Uh, went to work for a uh, trucking company in Xenia called Super Value Stores. How would uh, you so get to Xenia? Uh, my, when we left you uh, before the war, you're in Norfolk. There. Again, my sister moved. Where did my mother go with my sister? So, uh, when I got out of the military, my sister and her husband Bob said, "Why don't you come up here and spend some time? You know, relax, get your feet back on the ground, and decide what you want to do." And I said, "Okay." So I did. So I went up there and I got a job, uh, making a buck and a quarter an hour. Boy, I was on top of the world. And uh, did that for about a year and a half, and then the city started. The city was hiring for police and fire, and I thought, well, you know, that'd be a nice job to do. Kind of think I would like to do that. Well, I wanted to be a policeman. This is a funny story that my, uh, of course, at that time, and then we, I'd been married before that, and my wife took my application to the city building, and the thing, thing was they were given a test for both police and fire at the same time. But you could only take one. Well, I wanted to do police. My wife didn't. So she put the application in to become a fireman. <laughs> so lo and behold, I served 25 years in the fire department because my wife wanted me to be a fireman instead of a policeman. It looks like it was a wise choice. But uh, tell us about your wife, uh, her name, first of all. Her name's Debbie, or Deborah. And her maiden name? Snyder. Snyder. And tell us how you met her and, uh, <laughs> and what evolved. Uh, I was at my sister's house, and a couple doors down, the lady that babysat for my sister's kids had a daughter that was out of school. 
uh, she came up, knocked on the door, and introduced herself to me and said, you know, my girlfriend and I don't have a way to go to the movie. We'd like to go to the movie tonight. Would you take us? Sure, not doing anything else. Two girl, me and two girls going to the drive-in movie. Can't beat it. Did that, met my, the other girl was my wife. We hit it off. Uh, we got done at the movie. We took her friend home and then we went out, back out, and the rest is history. We've been together now 49 years. When did you get married? 1970. February 1970. And how many children did you? Two boys. Two boys and their names? Douglas and Joseph. I see. And what about grandkids? Two. Kingston Jacob Clark Doyle and Conrad Thomas James Doyle. You mentioned before your wife has something to do with the DAR. Well, she needs to. She, her family uh, came to America in 16-something in North Carolina from France. They were the Barriers, and the Barriers were a prominent family in southwestern Ohio. Uh, they owned land. They, he was a judge in Newmarket, Ohio, and he had a militia company of 100 men that served with Anthony Wayne at Fallen Timbers, Fallen Timbers. and then the uh, battles the battles that ensued from there went on uh, just went right on up, up into on the Maumee River. Yeah. yeah. And uh, her great great grandfather, uh, George W. Barrier, was the last Whig candidate for governor for the state of Ohio. And her cousin was Clarence J. Brown, the congressman that was from this part of Ohio for quite a while. And she had several senators in the state house, uh, the Breers, just a, a, a unique family, mm -hmm. and all. Uh, it didn't, the apple didn't fall on my wife's side of the family. <laughs> Did your wife uh, work? Yes, my wife worked uh, 29 years with handicapped children. I see. At a? At a school, uh, MRDD, mental, uh, re, uh, you know, for Green County. And she loved it, had a blast. She just retired last year. I see. So. Green County is where Xenia is? Yes, Xenia is in Green County. And I think, and how many years did you spend with the uh, Xenia Fire Department? 25. 25. I've years. been retired 26 and I worked 25. And you, uh, oh, you've been retired 26 now? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, but I haven't quit. You, uh, what position did you end up with with the Fire Department? Assistant Chief. Assistant Chief. Yeah. I, see. I got got taken out of the Chief's position by one vote, so which I would have dearly loved. I hold uh, two degrees from the University of Cincinnati. I hold a degree in civil engineering and I hold a degree in education. So when I retired, everybody, no, just about nobody at the fire department knew I had a degree. And when I retired, everybody said, what are you going to do with your degrees? I said, I don't know. I said, I got them. So I went to teach in high school. I taught uh, math, geometry, algebra, calculus, trig for 15 years and then retired. Wow. From Xenia High School. What a wonderful life you've had. Yes, yes. What a fulfilling life you've had. Well, I've been running drugs now for 10 years. <laughs> it's really getting fulfilling. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you better explain what you mean by that. <laughs> Legalized drugs uh, to uh, nursing homes in uh, Indiana, Kentucky, West Virginia, oh, Northern okay. Ohio. We leave out at 5 o'clock at night. Most of the drivers get back about 1. We deliver to nursing homes. I see. Uh, you know. Wow. But I almost didn't make it. Patrick, always, uh, Patrick and his lovely wife. And my wife went to dinner the other evening, and, I, and she was asking me about the fire service and everything. And I said, well, it's kind of an interesting career. I got run over by the fire truck in 1980. <clears throat> 1988, I went from the attic to the basement in a three-story building. 1989, I had a roof and ceiling come in on me. And in 1992, I had another roof and ceiling come in on me and trap me. The one in 92 trapped me for about three hours. And that was my career at the firehouse. You might have been better off being a policeman. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people I was in command for 18 years at the firehouse. Not one of my firefighters filled out a injury report in that time period, but I filled out eight. 
Eight of them. Eight of them on me, but none on them. Not on one of them. I tried to lead by this example. I was usually the first through the door. I didn't expect them to do anything I wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be a really good career. Yeah. Wow. That says volumes for you. <laughs> And then the teaching came along, and I enjoyed that. My wife and I also owned a business for about 20 years. Uh, and in, in between all of those things, we owned a fire safety equipment company. Oh. And uh, we did a lot of business all over southwestern Ohio. Uh, we took the business from a little small thing and exploded it into a big thing. Great. Wow. Finally, she said, honey, I'm getting tired. Let's sell. I said, okay, let's sell it. And you still live in Xenia? Still live in Xenia. Yeah. Right by the golf course, which is where I want to live. <laughs> uh, well, first you, Pat. Uh, do you have any questions today? I'm, I'm interested in the, the areas in Belgium and Germany uh, where you visited or served, what the conditions were as far as uh, remnants of the Second World War and, and buildings and reconstruction? Uh, there in Munich, uh, one concern where the 24th Infantry Division was, you could go over there and I mean you could see tank holes through the buildings, shells, potholes in the buildings from where World War II when the, when the uh, Allies land, came into Munich. Um, of course, Normandy, the bunkers and things like that that still remain. And up in Belgium, you could drive around and see places where uh, they had had been. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were, you know, there were a lot of places. I couldn't go to Berlin. I was not allowed to go to Berlin because of my clearance. And uh, they said, nope, can't go. That was the reason they turned me down from going to Vietnam was my clearance. They said, we don't want, do not want you in a combat zone. I said, uh, well, they're going to learn from me. I'm not going to tell them anything. <laughs> so have they rebuilt uh, Munich uh, when you were there? Yes, the, the uh, center-walled city in Munich was, was beautiful, I thought. I mean, of course, let's face it, those, those towns over there are four, five, six, seven hundred years old. Right. Um, they're all beautiful. The churches were gorgeous. Um, had fun at the Hofbrau House, you know, several of the, of the uh, houses there. And uh, it, was just, it was just a great place just a great place to, to go. In fact, my wife and I have our 50th wedding anniversary coming up. And I think one week's going to be in Ireland and one week's going to be in Germany, in Munich. Yeah. So we can did, see. Go ahead. Did you, uh, were you up near the Czechoslovakia border at any time? I got up there that one time when we, that's when the troops were amassed, uh, the American troops and the uh, Germans and the uh, Russian. You know, something to see, a lot of troops, a lot of, a lot of tanks. You know, I mean, it was there. If somebody would have just lit the match, it would have been a mess. Which I'm glad they didn't, but. How long did you stay up there yourself? Up there? Mm -hmm. oh, we were just there that day and then came back. It wasn't far for us to go from Munich up to there. Right. Uh, you know, we just drove up. When you say drove, uh, military uh, unit? Sedan, yeah, sedan. just a, a military sedan. And all. Pat, anything else, Pat? Nope, that's all I have. Yeah. Brian? Well, I was curious if you were in college studying engineering, how come you didn't get placed in uh, an engineering outfit or something? Because I was, oh, you mean in, in the uh, military? Yeah, when you got I to did. Out. I had orders out of basic training to go to Fort Belvoir, and they came on the bus and said, we want these people off the bus, and you're one of them. So off the bus I got, the other two guys left. I stayed, and about three or four days later, here comes the orders to go into Fort Dix to communications. I'm it was never explained why that was? Nope. I got a feeling that when you take your test, your battery test when you begin, mm -hmm. you get part of the battery test back then used to be dit and da. You know, you'd get, you'd get Morse code. And they would just say you wouldn't you wouldn't say the letter you just go dit da dit you know that that way. I must have aced that. So <laughs> you mentioned uh, you know when you left, had to leave Paris. Well, why did it all 
I'm not that familiar with, with French history. That era. Why did he kick uh, he, he kicked the entire NATO out of France because he wanted France to be France. He didn't want it to be anything to do with any other country. We weren't even allowed to have a flyover over France. Um, I, would, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even begin to tell you what I think of him because <laughs> he created too much work. <laughs> How much notice did you have to, to get out of We knew it was coming. We, we knew that uh, months in advance that it was coming. We just didn't know when. And then when we got the orders, everybody moved everything. I mean, you can still drive through France and see some of the bases uh, that we were at are just deserted and all. You mentioned that you had to, uh, I guess, whatever you couldn't take, you, you destroy it. I guess some of that was not even classified. Uh, is there a procedure of destroying classified information? Yes, there is. Most of it's burned if it's paper. If it's not paper and it's metal, like our uh, cryptographic equipment, you would just take a phosphorus grenade, pull the pin, set on top of it, and just let it it'd just destroy everything inside of it. Where would you do that? Like in an office building? Or in something? the building. Yeah, we didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't care. <laughs> Did you just have like a, a trash bin that you were just lighting papers and throwing in there? Uh, we had an incinerator. Um, we had an incinerator because we had so much communications that we had at the end of the week, we had a whole room full of bags to burn classified information. So you just had like a shovel that you just, <laughs> just the, the bags, usually at the end of the day, the crew working the night shift would, uh, when we'd run down the, uh, the teletype equipment, when we'd run it down and run it back up, the last thing is you'd take the TD off, roll it up, tie it, put it in the bag, fold the bag, staple it, mark a date on it, and throw it in the room. And then you'd start a new day. You know, kind of unique. I mean, you know, like I said, it wasn't rocket science. It just had to be done. I guess mostly you guys were, were you monitoring the Soviets, I guess? Yes. Most of the time. Most of the time. We even, and, I, and I'm still kicking myself, uh, at Munich, started with uh, Mars, the um, communica satellite communications was just starting and we would do punch cards. We'd get messages in on, we'd get a message in and we'd have to run it through, put it in on punch cards and then run the punch cards through the computer and then get the message that it sent and then get, <laughs> it, was, it was quite a, a, a lot of work, but that was the beginning of the satellite communications. What a dummy. Boy, I should have bought some stock back then. I knew it was coming and then now look at it. I mean, it's just exploded. Just a satellite. I mean, and that all came from the military. That all. Did you did you uh, have different shifts that you would work? Would you work an overnight shift? Would it change? It, when I got sent to Munich there in '67, uh, the reason they sent me down was because they were short of personnel, and we had two men on a shift. Seven in the morning to seven at night, seven at night, seven in the morning. We did that for six straight months without a day off. These two guys, these two guys. Did you get the switch guys? Did you have the same guy? I had the same guy. I had the same guy. Along with him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he lives in Louisiana. <laughs> You're still in touch? With Every now and then we, we get in touch with each other. Not, not often. Not often as we should. Did he, did he stay in the military? Did he get out when you got out? Of he was RA. He had already, uh, when he came through basic training, they gave you a choice. If you wanted to go active army, which was RA, you know, they had, at that time your IDs were US or RA. Well, US was everybody that was drafted. RAs were regular army. Those are guys that signed up for three and four years. So that he had signed up to, so he could get the duty station he wanted, which was Munich uh, and all. But he stayed, I mean, he stayed in another year and a half after I left till his time was up. And he stayed right there. And when you guys worked on the ship together, I guess he would have a different duty than you were doing. Would you switch off or did you guys have Didn't matter. We, that you liked better than the other? We knew what was coming down on the communications end of it. Uh, if we had outgoing communications, we would 
We just sit down in a teletype and just bang it out and send it either to the Pentagon or to Frankfurt or wherever in England, wherever it needed to go, Vietnam. We just send it all out. But uh, one was coming in, we'd you know process it in, process it out. And on. he had the same clearance I had. We both had top top secret NATO. So. And if we got a cryptographic message coming in, I mean, that's the bells and whistles. You'd get that in right up to top and say cryptographic, top secret. And then we knew we'd have to go into another room that had the crypto equipment and decipher that message and get it to whoever we had to do. At Munich, we had 5th MI, which we worked real closely with. We did a lot of stuff together. We had naval intelligence in Munich. I never could figure that out. We had naval intelligence in Munich. But they gave us the worst communications ever. We used to have to send back uh, Russian ship positions all over the Mediterranean, all over. And if you ever type, the Russian alphabet does not have a flow like the American alphabet. Well, they were a pain in the ass to type those ship positions because you had to type in the name, the coordinates, the latitude, longitude. Uh, and some days they'd only move that much. So, that was a pain in the neck, but, you know, that commander could come in with the Navy, I'd say, why don't you give us a break and take these to somebody else? <laughs> Send it Western Union, you know. <laughs> so but, you, you would get reports in Germany about Vietnam, of what was anything like that? We would see some things, but not a whole lot. Okay. Not a whole, we didn't have direct communications with them. We'd have to go through usually either England or the Pentagon. And, that was about it on that. Did you, did you ever have to worry? Will you ever have <laughs> about how this would, would happen? Would, uh, did, did, would they ever train you about uh, perhaps being uh, compromised by spies or something like yeah. that? Or no. <laughs> we knew. There was no training for that? You know, it's, yeah. that's why I laugh about this last political mess that we got ourselves into. Um, if I'd have done those things while I was in the military that some of these people have done, over the last few years, they told us, you might as well just pack your bag for Leavenworth because you're going there for 20 years. Well, why are these people still walking around that did right. similar or same as we did? And they're getting away with it. But times have changed. More liberal, more easy. Yeah. But. Well, you mentioned your, your was your oldest son? That, mm -hmm. Did he, uh, was he in the Army? He's in the Army. He's a Ranger. So he joined in 2000. And he no, he joined right out of high school. He was a kid. He joined the National Guard when he was in high school, his senior year. He's been in 25 years. He joined was, his was senior. Was something he was always interested in? Something he wanted to do. Something he wanted to do, and then, it wasn't because his old man. Sir, no, or? no, it wasn't because of me. That's for sure. <laughs> I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have made him do it. But he uh, did it on his own. He wanted. He always wanted to be, and he became a ranger. Became a sniper. And uh, he does a great job, what he does. Is he still in? He's still in. Oh. He's got 25 years in right now. But see, part of that's National Guard, and part of that's active duty. He's got 15 years active duty in the rest National Guard. And to get a retirement, you gotta get to 20. And the military will not let him get to 20 because they will not pay him that pension. They will pension him out on the National Guard, which he won't get until he's almost 60. So, he comes it, out of a different budget. He's kind of a catch-22. He said, Dad, he said, if these guys, if any of these guys that I work with here in Columbus even get close to 20 years, they get rid of them, get them out, get them gone, put them back in the Guard, and all. Well, he, he served in Iraq, right? Yes. Yeah. How 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 uh, how far along had the war started when he went over there? Had it been going on? Oh, well, not he, long. Was he, he, was he one of the first? When did it When did it start? February, March, February? March of 2000. He was there. He was there in March. Oh, he was there. He was there in March, because my wife and I were uh, driving to Las Vegas. We had visited her sister in L.A. and we were all going up to Vegas for a weekend. And the phone rang, and it was him from Iraq, uh, telling us, have you heard the news, any news? And Mom, of course, no. She, didn't, she wouldn't watch the news since he was over there. And he said, well, we just, uh, there was a Marine company that got into Fallujah 
without night vision. And his unit and another unit, there's five guys to a team, well, those ranger teams, uh, saddled up at night, went in and brought those, that, that company of Marines out. And on. he said, well, I just wanted to let you know before you heard it on the news. But uh, he had an interesting time. I mean, you know, he did a lot while he was over there. And I told him, I said, I want to tell you something, son. When that first bullet flies over your head, you're going to think twice. And he said, Dad, you were right. And all. And I know, he, I know, I don't, we don't even talk to him about, you know, killing people or anything. We know, I know for a fact, because he's talked to his dad, but he won't tell his mother. But I know for a fact that they were in quite a few firefights and did themselves well. Um, I'm pretty proud, pretty proud of him. That was a, that must have been quite a, a, an interesting for, for you to be able to be in communication with him oh, as much as you could. Saved my wife, saved her. If she hadn't been able to have done that, she would have went nuts. As most moms mm -hmm. would have. See, when I was in, they didn't know your your parents. They didn't worry about you. You get a letter every thirty days. They go, "Hey, he's okay." Right. <laughs> so they didn't care. <laughs> Somebody else is feeding him. Well, is there anybody? I think you mentioned a guy that you did duties with. Mm -hmm. Do you have you kept in touch with many people that you were in the in the military? It kind of got years ago. We did, and then it's kind of gotten away. Uh, of course, a lot of the people I was in the military with, especially my officers, are all dead because they're a little bit older. But, uh, you know, my generation's aging quickly. Uh, I hit 70 this past year. I'll be 71 in 12 days. So you only got a window of opportunity. It's getting uh, narrow. That's right. Isn't that the truth? That's why I told my wife I want to spend some of her money and go on a trip. <laughs> Do you think you'll uh, maybe take a trip? To, uh, well, I think you mentioned, aren't you going to go to Germany maybe? You're going to try and we're, uh, uh, we're trying to decide on our 50th wedding anniversary. We know we're going to Ireland because that's where my family's from, so Northern Ireland up around Belfast. And uh, we want to go back there. And then, of course, her family is from France, but she doesn't want to go to France, so we're going to go to Germany. We talked about it. Have you been back over there like yeah. you for anything since yeah. you served? Like I said, I did my time, I came home. <laughs> did it proudly. And I know all those places since I've been home have changed. Everyone, Paris, Brussels, Mons, Munich, they've all changed. Um, gotten bigger, more populated, more modern. Very true. But, well, that's all the questions I have. I had a couple I wanted to ask you. In your listening to the Russian communications, did you ever come across anything that was really critical to uh, the U.S. security or the Army security? Well, not here, no. Uh, basically, what we did more than anything was the communications between Russia and the Arab nations. We would know, you know, what was going on, what they were shipping, what, what was coming, what was going. Uh, that's basically what we did. We had an interpreter there that, that knew Russian, so we knew what was going on most of the time. And when you're in, when you're over there in, in Germany, did you take any trips out into the countryside? Did you visit any of the uh, concentration? Got to go to Dachau. Got to go to Dachau, and uh, got to go to uh, Hitler's retreat down in Berchtesgaden. Mm -hmm. That was really interesting. Again, there's engineering at that place, engineering marble, how they built that and all, with those bunkers underneath and everything. I'm glad they didn't destroy it after, at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and all. It's really something to see. It's beautiful up there to see, look out over those mountains and all. But, uh, you know, just, just those things, just, just got to see, you know, the sights. That, uh, got to see the castle, Cinderella's castle. What was the feeling when you went to Dachau? Oh, I was, I was uneducated to that. Uh, that was a shock. When you walk through, the, and they, the people of the survivors of Dachau have set, set up this whole museum 
uh, that you walk through. Dachau was different than a lot of the concentration camps. They did a lot of the medical experimentation there on the birth of twins, birth of multiple kids. You know, they would cut them open and they didn't care. They, they just did what they wanted to do. Uh, and that was kind of a shock to see that. And I know they got the Holocaust Museum down in Washington, which I want to go see, mm -hmm. uh, and all. But uh, it was kind of it was kind of an interesting place, and all. I I know they had several of them around, but uh, other than than seeing how the German people uh, work, live, and accomplished what they did, it was amazing to see. You talk about what they accomplished during the war? During the war, or even up through now. I mean, their, their engineering, uh, when they build an apartment building, we build an apartment building, we build it right here. Or floor by floor, apartment by apartment. When they build an apartment building, they build it by unit, an entire apartment. Then they raise it up, set it on the other one. Then they raise the next one up, set it on that. They don't, they build it all right, they build the whole apartment there, plumbing, mm -hmm. electrical, everything. Yeah. And then they just raise it up by crane and set it down. Connect it to the next floor and keep right on going. Their engineering is just amazing. Just amazing. We can, I mean, we could still learn a lot, probably. But Patrick knows me. He's, he's been my, uh, my nice go-to guy over the year, last few years and all. And uh, like I said, fire station, fire department, truck ran over me. Went down three flights of stairs. Two buildings come in on me, one trapped me. Here in the last few years, I've had two major accidents. A young lady hit me at 75 mile an hour up on Interstate 70, just about killed me. And then a state patrol employee broadsided me. So, and uh, a couple of my friends asked me, they said, well, how many lives do you think you got left? And I said, well, if I count everything up, I think I've used seven right now. I got two left, so I'm hoping I don't run out of lives before I run out of life. So <laughs> I can only admit, yeah, <laughs> so true. Anything else, Fed? Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, it's been a pleasure <laughs> reminiscing. Yeah. <laughs> like I told my wife, I said, honey, they're going to get done with me, and they're going to go, boy, this guy's the most boring guy we've ever talked to. Quite the contrary. <laughs> Darryl, it, thank you, sir, and a pleasure meeting you. Thank you for the you. interview, and thank you for the service to our country. I heard you say you were in, too. What were you in? I was in the Air Force. Air Force? Yeah. I, I,